We're so lucky today to have with us two wonderful authors, Bali Kors Jaswal and Harry Kutkins Roo, who are going to read to us from their recent books. I'm going to introduce them both in succession and then they'll read and then we're going to have a short conversation up here and then we'll open it to the floor. Um, so Bali Kaur Jaswal is the author of three novels, Inheritance, published in 2014, which won the Sydney Morning Herald's Best Young Australian Novelist Award, Sugar Bread from 2015, and the book she'll be reading from tonight, Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows, which was published last year. She's currently working on a fourth novel about three sisters who go on a pilgrimage to India to reconnect with each other after their mother's death, which is entitled The Unlikely Adventures of the Shurgal Sisters. Um, Hari Kunzru is the author of The Impressionist, which came out in 2002 and for which he won a number of awards, including the British Book Awards Author of the Year. He also refused the prestigious John Llewellyn Rees Prize because, he said, it was sponsored by The Mail on Sunday, which, with its sister paper, The Daily Mail, pursued an editorial policy of vilifying and demonizing refugees and asylum seekers, thus contributing to a pervasive atmosphere of hostility towards black and Asian British people. I think that's significant given the theme of the novels, um, both the novels today. Um, since then, he has also published the novels Transmission, My Revolutions, and Gods Without Men, as well as the short story collection Noise and the novella Memory Palace. Tonight, he will read from his latest novel, White Tears. Okay. Please come up. Hi. <laughs> um, the, the section that I'm going to read from is, um, it, it's actually one of the very few sections in the novel that doesn't feature the main characters in the novel. Uh, so I'll just explain the, um, the main character, uh, her name is one of the main characters, her name is Nikki. Uh, she has started uh, teaching these erotic storytelling classes in London, in South Hall in London, um, to this group of Punjabi widows. Uh, her mother doesn't know that she's doing this. Uh, her her um, her sister doesn't know either, and she's she's keeping it a secret from them. So they she knows they know that she has a job uh, somewhere doing something, and she's uh, they think that she's no longer working at the bar that they you know that they felt wasn't uh, wasn't a place for for a young woman to work. Um, they have no idea what she's been up to, and word has started to spread now. So her mother's about to find out. Um, this scene uh, takes place in the mother's living room where a family friend, Gita, uh, it has come over for tea. I think that's all you need to know. Gita was gesticulating wildly. Her henna-dyed beehive quivered from the force of her movements. Then they told him his shoes were too muddy to enter their country. Can you believe these people? Luckily, Nikki and Mindy don't have to travel anywhere for work. These customs officials can be so fussy. I thought customs in Australia was strict about muddy shoes from overseas because of foreign soil particles mixing with theirs, Harpreet said, ignoring Gita's subtle jibe at her daughters, whose unimportant jobs didn't take them overseas. Le foreign soil. What's so foreign about Britain's soil? No, I'm telling you, these people were giving him a hard time because they thought he was Muslim. Having already invited herself to Harpreet's home for tea, Gita was pleased to have an audience for her grievances. Her intentions of boasting were never subtle. In the past ten minutes, she had mentioned her son's trip to Sydney no less than four times. Harpreet wished she had gone to the temple yesterday. She had avoided it because she knew Gita was an avid attendee of all Enfield Gudwara's weekday programs. Then she ran into her in the Sainsbury car park. She checked the clock, still at least an hour before Mindy would finish her hospital shift and return home. Suresh said Sydney is very much like London, Gita tried again. What was he doing there? Harpreet asked. His company sent him there for a conference. All expenses paid. They even flew him on business class. He said, Mummy G, only the bosses fly on business class. There must be some mistake. Nowadays, there's so many budget cuts that even the CEOs are flying in economy. But they said, no, no, there's been no mistake. All part of the company's perks. That's nice, Harpreet said. She had no news of her children to boast of. 
Mindy remained unmarried and Nikki, well, Nikki had not said anything about her South Hall job stint starting. Earlier this afternoon, Nikki had brought the box of sweets and then hurried off, claiming to have some appointment, just as Harpreet was about to ask again how her job was going and what exactly she was planning to do with it. Harpreet got the vague sense that the job was not a subject Nikki wanted to discuss, which likely meant she had quit, just like she'd quit university. Gita responded to Harpreet's silence with a look of pity. Children will do as they please, she said generously. Not your children, Harpreet thought. But then, who wanted sons like Gita's? Grown men who still called her mummy. How is your yoga class going? Harpreet asked to change the subject. Good, good, Gita said, improving my blood flow. We need this kind of exercise. The teacher is a very lean woman, but she's in her 50s. She says she's been practicing for only a few years, but she's gained a lot of flexibility. Huh, yoga gives you strength. You should join us on Tuesday evenings. Harpreet could think of nothing worse than attending a yoga class with Gita and her gaggle of friends who spent more time backwards boasting than downward dogging. Personally, I prefer the gym. You joined a gym? A few weeks ago, Harpreet said, I just brisk walk on the treadmill and ride the stationary bike sometimes. I like going in the mornings. It gives me more energy. Energy for what? Gita said. At our age, we should be slowing down. Disapproval clung to her words. Everybody is different, Harpreet said. Leaning forward to pick up a piece of ladu, Gita's kameez dipped forward, revealing a deep line of cleavage. What I like about yoga is that it's all women. Is your gym unisex? Harpreet's face burned. She was trapped into answering Gita's question. So what if there were men at the gym? Yes, she said. Come to yoga, Gita said. It was a reprimand. There are other women like us there, she added. Ah, women like us, Harpreet said vaguely. If a uniform and a code of con conduct could be issued to Punjabi women over the age of 50, Gita would have designed it. How is Mindy doing? Gita asked. She's well, working today. Found anybody yet? I'm not sure, Harpreet said. This would be the default answer until Mindy was ready to get, uh, get engaged. The truth was Mindy had been seeing someone, but she hadn't mentioned him lately. Harpreet was afraid to ask. On one hand, she wanted Mindy to find someone and settle down, but it meant returning each evening to an empty home, and Harpreet wasn't ready for that. She'd better find somebody quickly, na. Nah? If she spends all this time looking and comes up empty, it looks bad. She'll find someone, Harpreet said. There's no use pressuring the girl. She can think for herself. Of course she will, Gita murmured. Harpreet poured the last of her pot of chai into Gita's cup. Black specks of Lipton leaves dotted the surface. Come, I'll filter them out, she said, taking the cup from Gita's hand. In the kitchen, she searched for her sieve and remembered having to throw away the one her mother had given her to take to England after Nikki and Mindy used it to scoop their goldfish out of its tank. She felt a pang of sadness. What was home without her family? Gita was brushing crumbs off her lips when Harpreet returned. No sugar, please, she said with the nobility of a dieter. But no combination of yoga poses would eliminate those ladu calories, Harpreet thought with smug satisfaction. Now tell me, Gita asked, and Gita said after taking a sip of tea, have you heard about these stories? What stories? The stories, Gita said. Harpreet found it difficult to mask her irritation. Why did people prefer repeating rather than explaining themselves? I don't know what you're talking about. Gita set her cup on its saucer. The stories that have been passed around the entire Punjabi community of London. When Mitu Kaur told me about them, I laughed and I didn't believe her. Then she brought one of the stories to my house. She said that she had read it aloud to her husband. And after that, she shook her head. Well, people get affected by these things. She stared at Harpreet as if this would help her absorb her point. They had sex on her sofa, Gita whispered. What? She told you this. 
I was surprised as you are, but the story was very involving. What's the book called? Harpreet asked. It's not a book, Gita said. They're just typed up stories. Nobody knows exactly where they're coming from. What do you mean? The author's anonymous? Supposedly, there's no single author. These stories haven't been published anywhere. They're just being copied, scanned, emailed, and faxed all over London, and they're reaching an intended audience. Mitu Kaur has read three already, and all three have completely transformed her relations with her husband. During yoga class the other day, when the teacher asked us to lie on our backs and pull our knees to our chests, Mitu winked at me and said, Just like last night. At our age, can you imagine? No,、nope, Harpreet said quickly, I can't. She was imagining, though. She was picturing herself with Mohan. Did Mitu tell you where she got the stories from? Her cousin passed them to her. Her cousin got them from a friend at the Enfield Temple who first heard about them from a Punjabi colleague who lives in East London. She lost the trail there because her cousin never asked the colleague where the stories came from, but Mitu Kaur isn't the only person I know who has come across these stories. Kareem Singh's wife told me she's come across them as well. The one she told me about was very graphic. A Punjabi woman brings her car to a mechanic and they end up having sex on the bonnet. She ties his wrist to the wing mirror with her debutta. <laughs> They're that detailed? Harpreet asked. I've never come across stories like this with our people in them. Rumor has it the stories are coming from South Hall. <laughs> That's ridiculous, Harpreet said with a laugh. I'd believe you if you said they were from Bombay. But if they're from England, they're not from there. No, it's true. Her aunt has a friend who attended a class there on how to write dirty stories. That made no sense. There would be riots in the community if such a thing existed, Harpreet said. That's why it's advertised as an English class. That's impot. Harpreet froze. South Hall? English class? Harpreet swallowed and kept quiet. She reminded herself that Gita was a gossip. Gita exaggerated. There was no reason to think. You know what else she told me? The stories are being written by older women whose husbands have died. Can you imagine? Women like us. Huh? Harpreet croaked. She took a gulp of tea. Of tea. Women like us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Very、uh, different tone I'm going to strike now. So,、um, I'm going to read from the beginning of this novel, which will keep it very simple because it means I don't have to explain any, anything to you at all. That summer, I would ride my bike over the bridge, lock it up in front of one of the bars on Orchard Street, and drift through the city on foot, recording. People and places, sidewalk smokers, lovers' quarrels, drug deals. I wanted to store the world and play it back just as I'd found it, without change or addition. I collected audio of thunderstorms, music coming out of cars, the subway trains rumbling underfoot. It was all reality, a quality I'd lately begun to crave as if I were deficient in some necessary vitamin or mineral. I had a binaural setup, two little mics in my ears that looked like headphones, a portable recorder clipped to my belt under my shirt. It was discreet, no one ever noticed. I could roam where I liked and then ride home and listen back through Carter's thousand dollar headphones at the studio. There were always phenomena I hadn't registered, pockets of sound I'd moved through without knowing. Every sound wave has a physiological effect, every vibration. I once heard a field recording of a woman singing, sitting on a porch. You could hear her foot tapping, keeping time. You could hear the creak of her rocking chair, the crickets in the trees. You could tell it was evening because of the crickets. I felt I was slipping, that if I wasn't careful, I'd lose my grip on the present and find myself back there, seventy or eighty years in the past. The rough board floor, the overhang of the roof. 
her voice traveling through the moist, heavy air to the diaphragm of the microphone, its sound converted into electrical energy, frozen, then the whole process reversed. Electricity moving a speaker cone, sound spinning into my ears and connecting me to that long ago time and place. I could feel it flow, that voice, inhabiting the cavities of my body, displacing the present like water filling a cistern. I heard Charlie Shaw on one of those recording walks. It was evening. I don't remember why I'd gone out. Perhaps I couldn't sleep. That happened. Perhaps I just needed to be outside or spend some time on my own. I often felt claustrophobic after long sessions. We could spend 12 hours in the studio without coming up for air. It was hot. The stifling New York heat that empties the city on July and August weekends. My shirt was clinging to my back. Passers-by were sheened in sweat, everyone desperate for the weather to break. I was recording by the chess tables in Washington Square. A guy called PJ, evidently the home favourite, was playing another man whose name I didn't catch. They'd drawn a little crowd. There was money on the table. A bottle was being passed around. PJ was one of the hustlers who sit at those tables day in, day out, playing all comers for ten bucks a time. He was a flabby white man in his 50s or 60s with thick glasses and several plastic bags of nameless crap stashed under the bench. The other player was skinny and black, hard to say how old because his face was hidden under a baseball cap. He wore a clean white undershirt and baggy blue jeans. His pair arms were painfully thin like two twists of fuse wire. This man was taking his time over his moves, enough for some of the onlookers to be muttering and telling him to make up his mind. He ignored them. Unlike PJ, who was chatting to his buddies, he kept his head down and seemed absorbed in the game. He was a good player, and soon he forced PJ to give up a knight and his queen. There goes my rent money, said PJ to anyone who'd listen. He was stuck on the phrase, repeating it until it became a tick. Each bad move. There goes my rent money. There it goes. Something about the stranger was making the spectators nervous too. He'd reach over the table, settle his long fingers on a piece, move it and then suddenly bring his palm slapping down on the clock. Each time he did it, an audible flinch travelled through the crowd, coughing, keys fondled in pockets. He was killing PJ, showing no mercy, and they didn't like it. Made in two, said the thin man, almost under his breath. Around the board... People fell silent. PJ nodded glumly and knocked down his king with a forefinger. Shoot, he said, now what am I going to do? As his friends gathered round to commiserate, the stranger counted his winnings, a wad of small bills. I was already turning away when I heard him sing. It was a blues, just a line. Believe I buy a graveyard of my own, he sang. Then he repeated it. Believe I buy me a graveyard of my own. On the audio, I can hear the change in the position of my head, the mics over each ear swinging, picking up a slightly different range as I turn around to listen. I don't know how to explain what happens next. My memory's clear. There was a skater, a girl. You can hear the rumble of a deck, but it's in the background. I distinctly remember turning to watch her. I I, I saw long black hair, tattooed sleeves, a nice arse and cutoffs weaving between dog walkers. Now, how would I know that if I hadn't turned? But the audio shows I didn't. The singer remains in the same spot. I remember that when I turned back, the game had broken up. It felt strange. It had only taken a few seconds for the girl to pass, but already the players and spectators were gone, the tables completely deserted. At the time, I didn't think too much about it. I was hungry, so I walked over to Sixth Avenue to get a slice. We were on the verge of being famous, bands wanted the sound we could make. We were booked months into the future and I, for one, could not have been more surprised. One day I woke up and there I was, 25 years old, in New York City and cool. I'd never been cool before, not at high school, not at the liberal arts college upstate where Carter and I met. He was cool. Blonde dreadlocks, intricate tattoos, a trust fund he didn't hesitate to use to further the cause of maximum good times. He had the best collection of vinyl records, the best drugs. He'd travelled and not just to high-tone places with his parents. He'd hiked in Nepal, driven a bus along the skeleton coast in Namibia looking for surf. 
I was a suburban kid out of my depth, even on our little campus in the middle of nowhere with its toy town Main Street, its atmosphere of sheltered rehearsal for the real world. My family didn't call it by a medical name, but in my teens, I had some kind of break or event. After my mom died, my dad and I discovered we had nothing to say to each other. He taught high school physics and was preoccupied with the problems of my kid brother, who was rebelling in a conventional cry-for-help way, smoking weed and shoplifting. It was easier for him not to notice that I was sliding too. So what if I didn't want to talk to him? One less person taking up his time. I was allowed to get on with it, whatever it was, losing my mind. For six months I didn't go to school, didn't even go outside. I only left my room on late night missions to kitchen and bathroom, scuttling back and forth like a cockroach. At the time, it suited me. Four walls. I used to lie on the carpet with my laptop and a keyboard and a battered old mic, making loops of my breathing, of the sound of the floorboards creaking as my dad and my brother walked around outside the door. I'd record these small noises and fool around with them, making phases, pitching them up and down. I was trying to hear something in particular, a phenomenon I was sure existed, a hidden sound that lay underneath the everyday sounds I could hear without trying. And sure enough, after months of obsessive listening, a sound did make its presence known. But it wasn't the one I'd hoped for. No pure high Buddha tone, no aural white light. I began to hear the past, the ambience of the room as it had been ten years previously, then twenty years, then fifty. The footsteps in the hall didn't belong to my dad or my brother. They belonged to someone else. Thanks very much. Thank you both. Um, so my first question is, um, Bali, you live in Right, most recently in Singapore, you've lived in a lot of places, and Hari, you've lived mainly in Britain, but you're mm -hmm. currently living here. Yet, yeah, both of your novels read as if you'd spent your whole life in Britain and the US, respectively, and it's really uncanny. So, in other words, you're both really good at conveying a sense of place, even when you're not entirely off that place. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you do that and what it's like to write about a place from a distance, a physical, psychological distance? Mm -hmm. I think having the distance is crucial for me as a writer. Um, when I'm in a place, it's a little bit too close, uh, and it's it's a little bit um, hard to imagine the details. It, it seems better to uh, remember the details of a place mm. and and also to long for a place. I think it's good to have a little bit of distance and to to um, sort of want to be somewhere. So you kind of write yourself into the place. My first novel, Inheritance, uh, most of or I started writing it. Uh, in England, and it was it was out of longing, it was out of yearning to mm. to, to be back there, uh, to be back in Singapore, and to um, you know the, the details became very vivid to me while I was away. But it was also necessary then for me to return to Singapore and and fill in some of the details that maybe I romanticized a little bit mm. uh, because of that yearning or longing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I've been here ten years now, and. Um, I don't know, there's a sort of imprinting that happens, especially with the rhythms of speech. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess you might know this yourself, mm -hmm. in that there is, a, there is a change in the vocabulary of the English that you hear around you, depending on which English language milieu you're in. And if you, um, yeah, I mean, if you, if, if you move, you find your language very, I mean, England, English is such an international la language now, but there is a sort of, a sort of a sort of trail or a disjunction that you find sometimes I think with uh, uh, with your English like I mean I've I've lived here and I've pretty much kept my accent as far as I can tell but um, my vocabulary has changed considerably I mean I'll tend to use like the American names for parts of a car or, or whatever it would be um, I did say to one of my students yesterday that he'd, I, I, you know, he didn't want to blot his copybook, and he looked at me like I was like from Dickens <laughs> um, so that I mean that was clearly a very a more English phrase than I had intended to use, but I mean, with this with this book, I mean, it was a book that I I, I wanted to write in order to to, to kind of um, to uh, was because I was already mixed up in all the strange 
questions around race and politics yeah. that, that dominate life here. And I come, I mean, I understand those, those conversations, but, they were, but I'd grown up with slightly different versions of them. And so coming, and, I, and there were things that I didn't understand about my new home and, and things that I'd, I needed to write about in order to sort through for myself, okay. to do with history, to do with, to do with the kind of things that poison every day discourse here. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a kind of thinking through of, mm -hmm. of a certain place and your relationship to it. Yeah. Um, so this panel, as you know, is titled Passion in the Art of Fiction and was conceived partly as a way to think about what it's like to be an author writing in a time of fraught political passions about more private passions through, you know, the depiction of individuals. Um, what role does passion, even your own personal passions, play in your novels as you understand it? Well, role does passion play well? It's called erotic stories. Yeah. The <laughs> yeah. There's a beginning. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose the suppression of passion and the way that it's policed uh, in conservative communities is something that really fascinated me. Uh, I'm often asked, you know, what, what inspired the novel, and there wasn't like this one moment, but there were all these these questions that I had um, throughout my life. I think I think one of the big questions, and I don't know if this is the same for for other people, but the first, like when you first find out about sex, <laughs> when you're when, when when you're a young person and, and and someone tells you about it on the playground or something, you you know you immediately go, but my my parents don't do that. No, <laughs> my parents wouldn't do that. Uh, that. And that's and the first time I sort of learned about what sex was, it was also oh I, I didn't realize that it actually had any connection to reproduction. Like that sort of happened later mm -hmm. in a formal kind of curriculum environment. <laughs> that was all they told us sex was about. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, so at first I thought, oh, okay, my parents, and certainly not my grandparents, certainly not my conservative <laughs> Punjabi grandparents from a village in Punjab, certainly not my grandmother, um, did that, uh, because that's that's uh, something that's very passionate, that's very naughty, <laughs> that's very um, that that that's very Western, you know. That that was that's something that you know people show and people show affection to each other so much more um, in the movies uh, and and then you know the. Than, than in my family. Uh, and so I remember just getting a real shock when I, it, it was, uh, became apparent to me that it, it does have a reproductive function. Then I thought, oh God, there's no escaping it then. <laughs> my, my grandparents did do it and my parents did it. And then that question just always kind of niggled at me. Like how, you know, how much did my grandmother really know about sex? Uh, she was married when she was 14 or 15. Uh, she doesn't even, I, I say 14 or 15 because she doesn't know her age, she doesn't know her birth date. She had no education. And to me, something like sex was something that you, you learned about after you were kind of educated about lots of other basic things in life. But for her, it would have been a very different experience. And so I always thought about how, um, whether, whether there was any pleasure in it for her and, and for the women of that generation. And what would happen then if the women who didn't talk about these things and were never allowed to talk about these things. What would happen if you put them all in a room together and they did start to talk about these things? Um, I think it's highly plausible that they would start an erotic storytelling club because, because of the passion that it ignites them. Um, not just about the sexual passion, but also the passion of uh, being able to talk about things that, that you, you've never been able to talk about before. I mean, I, I, I guess the, the, the connection with, with, with my novel would be uh, would be a sort of a, a, a passion in the in the sense of a, of, of a passion for music. I mean, um, that's the, yeah. the the obsession that drives the central characters in the in the novel. And um, yes, I mean, at, at seventeen, if I could have been a, a musician, I'd, I'd I would have I would have ditched my books in an yeah. instant and and uh, and gone there. But I mean, I, I had no no discernible talent um, and have contented myself ever since with being a with being a fan and have had some of my most sort of transporting artistic experiences listening to, to recorded music in mm -hmm. in particular I mean I think there's something about the the privacy that's possible in, in your relationship with a recording that um, that makes it often extremely intense and um, being a, a, a sort of nerdishly inclined 
uh, kind of man, I, I have kind of crossed paths with various serious record collectors and realised that I mean I don't quite I don't quite have that <laughs> desire to, to catalogue and accumulate that some people do. But I got very fascinated with the with the culture around um, collecting pre-war blues records, these seventy eight RPM records from the twenties and thirties, and um, they're quite scarce. There are very few people who are interested in them and so there is a, a a quite hermetic subculture around them and there's one particular aspect in the in with most with most newer recordings somewhere out there there's a master tape or there's a there's a sort of there's a perfect copy in a studio somewhere but with these by and large well completely there are i mean they were produced many of these records were produced in such a marginal um in almost informal way, like one of the larger blues record companies in the twenties was a furniture company that was mm. just putting the records out in order to uh, to sell um, gramophones, and um, and so in some cases they didn't even know what was released. I mean they were putting things together by looking at catalog numbers and gaps in catalog numbers between what they had and what they didn't. And so if you are a collector now and you have the cleanest, you know, best sounding copy of uh, of, of some 1920s blues record, then you are effectively the controller of that. Mm. And people have to come to you if they want to remaster it or re-release it or to do something with it. And that leads to some very interesting cultural situations and it leads to sort of strange... Uh, I mean, they're, they're often... Plot, the collectors that I've, I've come across are often plotting against <laughs> each other or trying to kind so of... Uh, in Just the book, like in, in the, the book, books, yeah. Of, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's trying to kind of work out how to uh, get a particular record out of somebody else's collection and into their own. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, so just a more sort of nuts and bolts question before we open it up to Q&A, but um, it's sort of about personal passion, I guess, or inspiration. What inspires you to write, um, not just sort of large things like the question of like whether your grandmother liked sex, <laughs> but, but also <laughs> what inspires you to write on a day-to-day -day basis? And like, what's your writing process? Um, I would say that in the past two years, the inspiration has been that I have to get it done because I've signed a contract. <laughs> That's my nuts and bolts. <laughs> um, so, you know, just, just, and... I mean, it, it was it was quite different from the way I usually write, which is not exactly when the inspiration hits me, but I, I did sort of write in little bits and pieces, and um, I would tell myself, okay, that's enough for the day, you know, put it aside. Sometimes if I didn't feel like something was working, I would let it breathe for a while. But when uh, you have a deadline that's sort of set by somebody else, then it's like you're on a treadmill, and you don't you can't really afford yourself many of those those um, breaks. So I think I think it really depends on the circumstances around the novel. Um, I think naturally my, my process is that to um, to take a little bit of time to I, I do like to plan a novel quite a bit. Uh, it doesn't go as planned usually, you know. There's but the shape of it is kind of there, and that's kind of reassuring for me because I know what I'm heading towards. Um, of course, you know things things kind of meander and and, and take a life of their own. Uh, with with a novel, with the most recent novel that I wrote, um, strangely the 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 way that I wrote it, which was kind of sitting at my desk and saying, "Okay, you have to write this much today, and just get it down before you get it right." Uh, strangely, that actually really fit this particular novel, which is about a road trip that goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And so this this was me just on a two year road trip <laughs> that, that kept going wrong because <laughs> I kept I kept kind of following the characters and wondering what they would get uh, get up to and um, and all the detours that that are inevitable when you when you plan a trip. Uh, and so I, I yeah I think it just it, I just kind of follow the project and, mm -hmm. and see how my, my process develops from there. I mean that that one sounds very familiar to me, and to, I mean that you. I think everybody goes from you know, there's that sort of moment when you realise yes, you're, you're you've signed a contract and you need to <laughs> you need to produce this thing even yeah. if you don't feel like it. But I mean I I, I do think that um, at the core of a novel, I mean in, uh, for me certainly there's a there's a there's there's some other sort of hidden personal question that I haven't quite managed to mm. formulate mm. and need to write around. Mm. I mean, I mean, it takes a long time to write a, a, a novel. I mean, you're, you're uh, mm. 
you know, by and large, people are people are taking a couple of years or, or, or more to 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 do it, and so the questions that you raise and and, and the material that you're using has to be uh, compelling enough to you on a personal level that you want to live inside it for that for that length of time. And 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 I find that for me, um, if it's something that I I need to work through for my own purposes quite separately from what might actually come out on the page then that's a that's a, a good reservoir of 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 drive i suppose to to actually want to complete the project mm. you know i mean it's a it's a, there's a lot of um you know placing the bum on the chair in front of the keyboard that has to be done in order to kind of make one of these things and 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 i think if you don't if you don't feel that you're growing during that process mm. then it's uh, it's not always very happy yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you. Uh, let's um, open it up to the audience. Yeah. This is a question for. Um, sorry. Can you wait for the mic? This is a question for. Is this working? Yeah. Yes. For you, Bali. Um, I haven't read the book yet, but um, I've been meaning to for a while, which is why I was very excited that this <laughs> event was happening. My question is, you just mentioned that you were kind of motivated or intrigued by the secret mm -hmm. sexual lives of women who are repressed or oppressed in certain cultures. So why did you choose to set it in this time and not, let's say, in your grandmother's time? Oh, um, well, I, I was most interested in the tension between these women uh, and the society that they live in. Uh, and I, I found it. I found South Hall, London, really fascinating because it's this immigrant enclave uh, in London, and it is. It is as if um, an Indian village was preserved in time. It really feels that way. Like people settle there, and then they kind of, um, you know, sort of removed themselves in a lot of ways from from the rest of London and, and the rest of British society. Um, and I, I was I was very interested in how women like that exist in a society like that, uh, and and how they they close themselves off. And I, and yeah, I, I guess that was that was my my inspiration for that. There was there was that whole east west divide that I found really interesting, and the intergenerational tensions as well between these women and the young woman who's British uh, and you know British and Punjabi who thinks that she's coming in to sort of liberate them. So she, she learns a few things in the process as well, and I wanted that tension to be there between modernity and tradition. Yeah. Oh. Amoni, this question is actually for, for both of you. You know, do you ever find, given that it's a two-year process to, to write a book, that your characters actually evolve in unexpected ways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I th certainly, um, the characters in this novel certainly evolved. And I, I mean, they all do, uh, because the the cast of characters in this novel is so large. It was sometimes it's like hurting um, school children sometimes. <laughs> yeah. it, I had to kind of um, watch their character arcs very closely, and that was one of the biggest things that happened in the revision process in the editing. Because when you're writing a story and you're kind of going, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get to the end and you're trying to get to the climax um, of the story, sometimes you, you can neglect the individual character stories. So that was something that was picked up a lot um, by my agent and by my editors as, as we went along. You know, how about this person? We don't hear much from her later. And I said, oh, I forgot. <laughs> forgot about her. We need to bring her back. So I think that that happens. They do take a life of their own. I missed these characters in particular so much after I was done. I was really, I really mourned um, the end of writing this book. Uh, even though, you know, it, like with all writing projects, it's a struggle, it's hard, and, and, and as you're doing it, you're like, when am I gonna finish this? But once it was off to the printers and it was, it was done, I um, felt very loyal to them in a way. <laughs> like I didn't want to start anything else because I, I just really missed them because uh, they really came alive to me and they changed so much. So they, they became independent of me as I wrote the novel. Uh, and that, that's, a really, that's such a gift for, for a writer. Yeah, I mean, some, sometimes when when you do you finish, they they hang around and you find their voices in inappropriate contexts kind of coming coming out. Um, 
it's it's a funny business between uh, you have to find the sweet spot between planning and and serendipity. I think. I mean, if you you know if you don't plan enough, you you wander lost in the possible space mm -hmm. of your of your story, and you know you don't work out. And you know, often you have to find out whose story it is. Really, you it's it's maybe only be part of the way through that you discover the center of the thing that you're trying to. Mm -hmm. To write, but then on the other hand, does you know if you if you over plan, then there's a sort of deadness to the execution of the plan. So, I mean, what I like to do is to to know in a day's work that there are certain marks I have to hit. You know, certain thing. You know, mm -hmm. certain things have to happen in a scene, or um, but I I won't know how they happen until I actually sit down and write it. And then, you know, you have to be able to uh, to accommodate digressions and to accommodate yes. a certain amount of. Uh, of the unexpected, mm. but yeah, but to know when it's actually just leading you off the cliff, I suppose. <laughs> More question. Is this is son? Yeah. Yes. So you you mentioned that you lived with questions and issues and ideas for like maybe two years, and it takes you a long time to write mm. uh, a novel. Have you gotten ever to the point where you're like? substantially down the road and you realize, wait a minute, I should have written this in third person instead of first, <laughs> and then redo the whole thing. And I've done that, yeah. 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 <laughs> I have, I, I'm, actually, specifically that. Yeah, the, I was wondering I have, I have changed the voice of a, of a manuscript many thousands of words yeah. in. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, that's what I mean about finding the center of something. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's one of those decisions that you may think you have handled at the beginning, and then a fair way in, you realize, no, no, I'm just hearing this person speak. It needs mm. to be in a, in a first person, for example. Yeah. Uh, when I started writing erotic stories for Punjabi Widows, I, I hadn't written something a little more lighthearted uh, before, uh, and I didn't really know how to set the tone like tone tone and voice were, were a real challenge for me so I thought about first person and then um, I decided to go into third person since there were going to be different characters perspectives um, and I I don't think there are any there's any evidence of those earlier drafts and I hope I hope I've deleted all of them uh, because that my my first start was you know okay I'm gonna this is gonna be a humorous novel so I'm gonna try to be funny and it was yeah that's always a bad idea it was I you know it was like the a comedian who's standing in front of a brick wall just like telling jokes that don't land uh, there was a lot of a, a lot of very contrived humor that I was really really forcing. Um, and so then I tried a different angle, but it was too somber and it was too dark and it wasn't what I was going for. So I, for me, it was, it, was um, it takes me a while to get the voice right and to hit the right note. And sometimes I can be quite far along um, in, in the story before I, I you know, get, get um, the essence of, of that voice right. Bali, you, you you mentioned that the distance clarifies details for you. Mm. If you have if you have written or if you have to, if you decide to write in future book about a place where you've never been to, mm. what techniques you would use to provide the details? Mm. Will it be purely your imagination, or it will be research, or you talk to people? Um, I would I would travel to that place. I don't I don't think I, I'd be able to write a novel about a place I haven't been to. I, I think it's it's unfair to the place. Uh, the the novel that I have just finished writing, uh, it's set in India, but it's about three British Indian women who travel there. It's a road trip novel, and it's it's from the perspective of outsiders. And I travel to India and did most of the things that they would do so that I could you know kind of see see what they would see. Um, but it is still very clearly an outsider's novel about India. I would never, I would never write a novel from the perspective of someone who was born and raised in Delhi just because I went there for a couple of days. I don't think I, I'd be able to do that. But I think if I wanted to, I think a lot of research, like you know, people who write about um, historical, you know, who write historical fiction, for example, cannot go there. <laughs> but a lot of research is necessary. Um, getting getting a lot of the the details right um, and the nuances right, I think is really crucial. Yeah. 
Um, thank you so much for your wonderful readings. Um, I actually wanted to basically just ask the question that the blurb kind of uh, presents to us because I think this is really interesting. Um, uh, and I know both of your books were published in 2017, so I don't know, um, you know, at what point they were actually finished because it also, also takes long takes a time for production. But I guess I'm just wondering, um, as diasporic authors. Um, in a moment of Brexit uh, crashing and Trumpian politics and just, you know, the sort of awfulness that we live in. Um, do you feel a, like, how does, that, how does that infiltrate your own writing? I feel like we heard really fascinating personal uh, inspiration stories from you both, but I'm just wondering, you know, how does one, uh, does one be a creative writer in, in what seems like, you know, a kind of boiling moments that we're in. Mm. What is the atmosphere in which you work? I think mm. it ends up in, in the work. And I mean, for me and my family, it's been an atmosphere of, of real unease, of uncertainty whether we'll be able to stay. Um, you know, our backstop was, was going back to Britain. I mean, my wife's American, Japanese-American. I mean, she has some opinions about... Uh, Things you know, but the uh, limits of, of uh, American tolerance towards minorities, um, and yeah, we we we're we're finding that that's it's 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 the the air that we're we're breathing at the moment is this uh, sense that we don't know quite how far it's going to go, mm. we don't know quite where the bottom is, um, and what will be expected of us in in the future, and and it is odd to be doing long creative projects at a time when the ground shifts so much under your feet. I mean, I'm writing a novel that I, I started in, uh, in 2016, and a lot has changed since then, but um, it, it is all finding its way into the, into the book, perhaps in a sort of coded way, mm -hmm. but nevertheless. Yeah. Um, I think so. Some some people have said that one of the silver linings, if you can call it that, of the current situation in the world is that um, there's a lot of um, political um, activism and a lot of social activism, uh, which I see. You know, because I'm, I have a bit of distance from the U.S. I live in Singapore. I see a lot of it online, and I see a lot of conversations online. Uh, and I procrastinate a lot when I write, so I, <laughs> I go on social media a lot. It surprises me how much those conversations kind of um, informed and provided context for for this novel, because there is that tension towards Im uh, immigrants, uh, even though the, the novel was written before sort of most of the awfulness <laughs> of 2016 um, really started to bubble. Um, and so that yeah, there were a lot lots of those conversations. Like sometimes when I was writing. Um, I would, you know, think, think of a, a, a situation or, or even a word, and I would, and, and, and a conversation that came up in social media um, about, you know, being inclusive or um, about privilege would, would come would come up. It would just sort of pop into my head, and I'd be like, oh, I should think a little bit more about that. I should be a bit more considerate about, you know, the way I portray this, or um, you know, I should consider consider this group of people as well. So I think that, like I said. It's not much of a silver lining, but but in a way it is as well that there there has been a lot of conversation and that uh, helps us to create the, our fictional conversations. Oh, Go ahead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, you get a mic coming. Uh. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd like to talk about your collaborations with film. Because um, I know Bali's <laughs> had some, and I was wondering, right. like, I, I imagine how you've been approached, and uh, because yeah, I, I guess. Um, do you mean ad adaptations or, or, or kind of other other kinds of? I mean, I I, I have written screenplays and uh, and and I'm sort of involved in the in in that kind of way. It's it's it's. Uh, it's strange for a novelist to to work as a screenwriter, and mm. I mean, I'm I'm very I always it always makes me very glad that I have my novelistic practice as sort of fiefdom, uh, <laughs> a kind of place where I can be uh, the undisputed uh, lord of all I survey, or at least until I you know show it to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you know, film is essentially collaborative, and writers are fairly low down the 
the totem pole in 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 sort of traditional mm -hmm. cinema auteur cinema is a disaster for writers tv mm -hmm. much better for writers T writers yeah. end up as showrunners in in tv um for erotic stories uh, film rights were <laughs> sold but that that doesn't mean that I know anything else beyond that. <laughs> uh, Film Rights was sold two years ago. Uh, I've I've talked briefly to the screenwriter that they've got on board, and it's it's just really a slow process that that doesn't really involve me very much. Uh, I'm I've I've got a consultant role, but who knows you know how how much the scope of that will be. Um, my first novel, Inheritance, though, was adapted, and I see you grinning because you actually went to you you were at the the opening. <laughs> Uh, by it was a, a film was commissioned by the Singapore uh, International Festival of the Arts last year, and a director um, did this sort of interactive film experience inspired by the novel. Very crucial that he called it inspired by because it was, it was very different from the novel. Um, but the the set was this huge old colonial um, bungalow in Singapore. And they bust in people who uh, were festival attendees for three days, different sets of people, um, who dressed up like they were going to an Indian wedding, because it was the whole thing kind of took place around a wedding. Um, and they showed up and they watched a couple of scenes unfold like it was theater, but then they were also filmed as extras. So they were guests at the wedding. Mm -hmm. And the bungalow was sort of, the bottom floor was a functional film set for like, you know, it was, it was decked out like a wedding, uh, a, a wedding house. And the second floor was actually um, set up to be like a museum to the novel. So different rooms had sort of different surreal <coughs> exhibits uh, that the extras could, could walk through and learn about the novel so that when they, you know, played their role, they had some context. They really, they should have read the novel, <laughs> really. But, <laughs> just, just realized that. Um, but they kind of got a walking tour of, of, of the novel. And it was all very conceptual. The, the film was a lot of different things and it was uh, very much in, yeah, inspired by, uh, like the director took the idea and sort of ran with it. Uh, I wasn't, I, I was asked a lot whether it bothered me that it wasn't like the, the um, novel or whether it would bother me that you know, erotic stories isn't like the novel. I, I don't, I, I feel that it's, it's such an incredible privilege for someone to take your art and make more art. Like that, that's just so cool to me that it, it really uh, didn't bother me at all. I was just happy to provide the inspiration and I was uh, so happy to walk around this, this huge house that was filled with things that started here for me. I thought it was just, it was just incredible. Yeah. Hey, we have time for just one more question. Back there. Yeah, you. <laughs> All right, I have a question about the writing process itself, mm -hmm. right? So writers are artists, but the act of producing a novel is, as I see it, also partly an act in project management, because given <laughs> the sheer length of what you produce, yeah. it ends up being this sprawling project, and the process of producing it is nonlinear. Mm -hmm. Now, you can learn the craft of writing by reading other people's finished work, but nobody really teaches you how to put together something that you created in bits and pieces. Uh, so I imagine you have to learn from yourself over time. Can you talk a little bit about your respective processes and how you learned as you iterated on your own work? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wish somebody had been able to, to show me. Uh, I mean, planning was the, the lesson I learned, I learned hard. Um, the first novel that I tried to write when I was uh, in my early 20s, 21, 22. I mean, I was really, I don't want to make a plan, I want to go forward. And, uh, and I mean, I did that thing of, 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 you know, the man painting the floor of the room and ending up in the corner. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I really could not get to from, you know, where I'd found myself to the end, to the end that I needed to, to do. So, I mean, I, I learned various planning and project management techniques. And I think the, the, the most significant of which are the various ways to give yourself a productive day on the days when you're not inspired. Mm. Because I think, I think people who don't write have a rather sort of romantic notion that you, know, you sit there and the muse mm. comes and you know, the, the music swells and you know, you're suddenly kind of <laughs> typing on the typewriter. Um, 
And then really, you know, a lot, a lot of days you're, you know, a bit fuzzy in the head or you didn't sleep properly or you have other things on your mind or, you, you know, tax return, whatever it could be. And you need to have, you need to have things you can do that don't require you to sort of pull from the depths of your soul this morning. Um, and so, yeah, that's, and just having, you know, having good notebooks, having a plan, having kind of lists of things that you can kind of do to your, your manuscript, you know, other than just composition out of nothing. It's, it's, a, it's a technique I, I, I'd say learned, but you know, yeah. found. I'd say, yeah, very similar. I, going off of that, uh, the, the, I, I believe it's really important to show up even on the days that you don't want to show up because you, you will get something done. Like even if you say, okay, I'll just spend half an hour on this um, today, even though I really don't feel like it, that's better than sp spending no time at all. Um, and it could be something that you throw out, but you have to write things that you throw out anyway. <laughs> so you might as well do it on, on a day that you don't feel like writing. I recently heard some advice that I, I think is great, which was plumbers don't get to have plumbers block. <laughs> so just get to work, <laughs> which, which I think is, is very true. I think the idea of writer's block sometimes, um, it, it, it is quite, it, it, it's counter to that romanticized idea of writing and or it's part of that romanticized idea of writing uh, and and I there are so many other things as Harry said that you can do with your draft uh, you can look at another another piece of writing uh, you know that uh, you can you can write something completely different while you're writing uh, the thing that you're focusing on you can maybe write some nonfiction or write a diary entry or something but I think you do feel a lot better at the end of the day that you've been productive in some way I think for me, I, every time I finish a novel, like the, you know, the, the, I think a lot of people expect that uh, you get better and better at writing as you gain more experience. I would say I, at the end of writing a novel, I think the experience that I've gained is uh, I've, I've become very good at writing that novel. <laughs> and those skills aren't necessarily transferable to the next one. I would say the only thing that, that improves as I uh, move from book to book or from project to project is um, I'm less precious about throwing things out. So initially I was like, oh, but that was such a great sentence. So that was such a great chapter. I don't want to let go of it. Now I'm quite good. At, I'm quite, you know, good at being brutal about self-editing. But other than that, you really, you start all over again and you learn how to write a novel and build a novel all over again. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Yeah, sure. If I speak loud enough. <laughs> um, do you find that things like paper and notebooks work better? than trying to work entirely inside inside computers mm. where like finding stuff is hard but like flipping a few pages is yeah. easier even though the process of actually writing is arguably easier when you type but like yeah. going back and revisiting stuff is harder do you find that i think everyone has a different sort of um process with that and a different comfort level with computers versus paper i have both um, but i find that paper is better for planning so I have, I have a notebook for planning or for sketching out ideas that, you know, if the, if the draft is going one way and I'm, I'm, I'm writing the story on the computer, but I have a little thought or, you know, a bit of a digression or a bit of dialogue that I heard that might be perfect, then that goes on paper. Uh, but the, the, the solid draft, that's typed up. I don't know. How about you? Very similar, actually. Yeah. I have paper notebooks that I carry mm -hmm. around and that, I, that are what I end up doing kind of inscrutable diagrams on that's supposed <laughs> to be the plot of the <laughs> thing that I'm working on, and then, and then the act, I write I write straight onto uh, onto the screen usually. I mean, and I I, you know, I think find and replace is just one of the greatest <laughs> gifts to, to a writer that's ever been offered. I mean, and I and I have become increasingly sort of granular about my drafts because I mean, there's that thing where in a word document or whatever it is where you strike something and then you realize 10 days later that you quite liked something in that paragraph. Yeah. So I, I, now, I now rename my document each time I work on it. Oh, wow. So I end up with this, I end up with a kind of complete record of how it's sort of shifted day to day. And then I can kind of go, you know, if I imagine something was in there a month ago, I can just pull up an old version of it and search in, in that and find it that way.